Good day and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on tight and get ready for an electrifying jolt of adrenaline because we have a guest on our show today who's brought the house down in more ways than one. From the high-flying thrills of Wired to the heart-pounding action of X-Men Apocalypse and the jaw-dropping stunts of Shazam, this individual is a true maestro of the high-octane world of stunt performance, fight choreograph, and stunt coordination. The remarkable talents have graced some of the biggest blockbuster hits and fan-favorite TV shows including Star Trek Beyond, Assassin's Creed Origins, The Boys, Dark Phoenix, and so many more. With a resume that reads like a who's who's of Hollywood's finest, our guest today is not just a performer, but a mastermind behind the scenes, choreographing, choreographing breathtaking fights, and coordinating heart-stopping stunts that leave audiences on the edge of their seats. But that's not all. We get an exclusive look into the world of this dynamic force of nature, discovering what it takes to make the impossible possible in the world of entertainment. So prepare yourselves for a roller coaster ride through a thrilling career of a true action hero. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daniel Levine. Thank you so much for your time, sir, and welcome to our show. Wow. Thank you for that intro. Wow. Holy. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. I should have that everywhere I go. I'll I'll ensure you get a copy and you can make it your ringtone. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> I, I want to dive into it with you. How did you get involved in the world of stunt performing? Ah, uh, <laughs> um, I think if you were to ask 50 stunt performers how they got involved, you'll probably get 50 different answers because there's no set path. It's not like I go to school, then I apply here and then you get the gig. So everyone has their own way how they got in. For me personally, I have a background in martial arts and gymnastics, which really helped. But I'm um, originally from Ottawa, and I didn't know that a stunt performer was a thing that you can build a career on because there wasn't really any at that time. So I actually got through through acting, and um, so I started through acting. Went to school for filmmaking and acting. And it wasn't until <clears throat> a buddy of mine was making an independent film. And then we had local people be like, oh, no, this, you know, it's going to be action. It's going to be some fighting here. It's going to do this and do that. And then you you build this team and we all were just constantly pushing each other. And um, project is done. Then the word of mouth goes out. And then you slowly start networking. It's like, oh, you should meet so-and-so coordinator. They're in Montreal. Or you should meet so-and-so coordinator They're in Toronto. And then you go and you meet everyone. And then they're like, they invite you to either work for them or train with them. And then you slowly build your career that way. At least that's how it was for me. Um, so I would definitely have to give a, a huge shout out to uh, a few people. Dennis Lafont, uh, another performer, amazing, talented performer from Ottawa who we really pushed each other because we had no idea how to get into it. We really didn't. So we just uh, create your own stuff and things will slowly snowball from there. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. No, it does. Yeah. And you said you have a, a background in martial arts. What was the, um, the style that you studied? So I did karate. So I started when I was seven um, and I did it competitively. Um, and that's actually a funny story how I started doing karate. So Young age, I watched this movie you might have seen or heard of. It's called Bloodsport with uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. And I'm like, to my mom, I'm like, I want to do that. What I meant was I want to be on TV and, you know, like just kick butt on, on TV and the big screen and stuff. And uh, she's like, oh, it's a karate movie. You must want to do karate. So next thing I know, I'm in karate class. I'm like, what's, what's happening here? What am I doing here? And I just fell in love with it, to be honest. Um, it helps me in so many ways. And so I started doing karate and then competing all over the place. And um, yeah, stuck with it forever. Now, knowing at such a young age that you wanted to be in acting from watching Bloodsport, <laughs> how do you think that helped shape the understanding of yourself and who you are today? Um, so it's one thing to know what you would like to do or what you would like to become, 
But then it's also another thing to navigate. How are you going to get there? That age, that age, I had no idea. I just, I just knew this one I wanted to be, and I have no idea. So maybe the way I go about it might be a little bit unorthodox, or especially in the filming industry, because there's no set way, especially for stunt performers. But even growing up and not having any like um, anyone to look look up to in terms of like stunts is you really it forces you to create your own stuff so not wait for an opportunity to come to you because that's i mean if you're acting you're waiting for the next audition you're waiting for the next gig uh it just puts you more in a, almost like an entrepreneur mindset like i need to create for myself so then you get into writing you get into producing you get into acting and a whole bunch of different field and i think that really helped me till today like because you're able to really figure things out much sooner, much quicker on the spot, on the fly, which a lot of the business is what it's about, really. Now, when we look back at your at your starting of the career, you knew you wanted to be an actor and get into the entertainment industry. If you if you look back and say, hey, you know what? What other path was available? If you didn't follow acting and being in the entertainment industry, what do you think you would have done? Great question. Great question. Uh, I go back and forth on this a lot because it's it's i always find it interesting how every decision you make there's a ripple effect so it's like what if i would have done this that probably wouldn't have led me here but to be honest um i probably i went to algonquin college in ottawa and i took hotel and restaurant industry and um i had no interest in the restaurant world uh just because it was merged together but i love traveling so I was like, as a kid, I was like, oh, I love traveling. Maybe I'll have my own, uh, you know, hotel chain or something like that. So I probably would be more into the hospitality industry, to be honest. Um, more, uh, maybe not necessarily working in a hotel today, but probably be out somewhere, remote island and having uh, little boutique villas and renting it out there. At least that's my retirement plan. That's the idea. But yeah. So I'm still, still going to do it. So yeah, put that uh, that diploma to work. I love that uh, retirement plan. I, I might be your assistant. Um, ah, there you go. <laughs> so like <it>. Pack up. <laughs> so when, when you were growing up and you watched Blood Sport, which is an amazing film for a lot of reasons, did you have any other role models or influence that you kind of looked to to say, you know, I want to adapt that type of style or, you know, I want to try to be this type of actor? How would that journey look for you? To be honest, I didn't have, I wouldn't say I had a role model. Oh, sorry, let me just, I wouldn't say I had a role model in in terms of like acting at that young age when I first, first started. My role model, to be honest, was uh, my martial arts instructor. So Steve Anderson, who in the karate world would be known as like the, the Michael Jordan. And just his mindset alone, what that instills in me as a young boy growing up to be a young man and an adult i i take with me every day till this day i mean the, just the power of the mind what you can really convince yourself to do is the biggest learning lesson i've learned uh through my role model which is steve anderson and that that alone i think the decision for my mom to put me in karate at such a young age was in my eyes was her best decision for me because it's something I still use. I still, uh, everything that's instilled in me, I, I use every day. So that's that's huge. Yeah. When we look to your martial arts career and your background and your role model, what training outside of martial arts has prepared you to kind of really pursue stunts as a profession? Outside of martial arts? Yeah. You know what? Everything's going to lead into martial arts but i had a training partner his name is ben stewart in ottawa who was very much um entrepreneurial and he is a great business businessman but me spending time with him in his business and his, at the time his business was landscaping so it's like aeration and even driveway ceiling stuff like that just me spending like a year or two with him working with him was the equivalent of me getting a degree at a five-year school on business alone. So to do that, I early-ish age, I, was, um, I started doing that in my late teens, just to learn on the business part. 
But that carries over even till today when you get a show and you're able, I mean, you get a show, you have to be able to send out a proper budget. You have to organize everything. You have to be able, able to adapt on the fly. So that's huge because that's not something you don't, you're not getting lessons taught to you once you're in the industry. Uh, you you really have to adapt. But I was fortunate enough um, to have all that prior experience before even starting to where I'm at today. So as martial arts plays a, a large role for anybody who chooses to pursue stunts, is there a specific style that you would say is more beneficial than another? Yeah. Depends on your body type. Uh, depend, depends on your physicality. But a rule of thumb, I would always say if someone's like, because people always ask, you know, what type of martial arts should I learn if I want to get into the uh, business? Probably boxing to learn how to punch correctly and engage on proper distance. So you actually don't hit the actors. Um, but more importantly, <clears throat> to learn how to fall properly. So when you're getting beat up or you're, you're getting thrown here or there, you got to make it look like it hurts without actually mm -hmm. hurting, right? Uh, so whether it's judo, jiu-jitsu, probably I would, I would combine judo and boxing. Um, and then if you have a grasp of it, then you can learn other style but those would be the the fundamental styles i would introduce to people who are interested in uh, stunt work nice and those would be your your building blocks and the principles of we're getting into stunts let's get some boxing let's get some judo and kind of figure ourselves out from there yeah that's awesome sure. and when you look back on your career doing stunts can you recall one of the most challenging stunts you've had to perform oh where do i go chris oh my god challenging okay i'll tell you this <laughs> challenging might not be the most terrifying so for me <laughs> challenging is uh dealing with cold weather so i had a i had a gig which it was it was awesome it turned out great but it's in the, we're in the middle of january and i'm wearing linen pants and a hawaii like a hawaiian shirt and I have to fall into the water and fight in the water and then get out of the water and then fight in the snow, roll around and um, and just you constantly doing that back and forth. And it was such a long day. It's uh, just mentally to deal with freezing and just to deal with cold. Um, I think those are more challenging than for me, stuff that I've done, like falling off a cliff or even getting set on fire. Uh I would always pick those over like a cold day where I have no choice but to just freeze. Uh, just they're mentally challenging. But uh, I mean, you're, you're fortunate because you see, and at that time, that specific gig, I was a stunt double and the actor did the same thing I was doing. So kudos uh, to the actor. He was awesome. But yeah, that was probably one of my most challenging day because it was just cold. <laughs> Now you, you did mention that uh, terrifying and challenging are a little bit different. What's <clears throat> what's kind of a terrifying stunt that you've had to do? I think the first time I was set on fire, um, not because I didn't trust the people around me, like I definitely did, just because you never know. I mean, how do you test? You can't slowly test it. You just you got to set yourself on fire. So that was probably the most terrifying. But once you actually do it totally fine it's something i would do over and over again but yeah some stunts you do and you're like oh you probably do this again like uh certain high falls or a specific car scene or whatever but yeah I, for me it would be the uh gonna set on fire it sounds pretty crazy when you're like oh how was your day oh it was fantastic i got set on fire but yeah but it was fun so out of yeah. curiosity how many times in a year would you be set on fire in a year? Oh no, not much. I've only done it twice <laughs> in my career, so it's not it's not a daily or a week. it's not a monthly thing, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Although there's some great performers who do it often, you know that's what they're known for. Um, but it's not a it's not a weekly thing, Chris. Not for me. No. So how do you prepare for this? Like, what what is the the mental state in that emotional roller coaster where you know you have to put on a performance, you have to make it sellable and real and magical but you're on fire or you're falling from great heights and you also have to worry about yourself physically. What What is that mental state for you like? 
That's a great question. Um, so for me personally is trusting the team that you're with. So the crew that you're with. So at the time I had a great stunt coordinator, you know, I had some, a fight, great fire team and production really understood what we're doing, but also uh, they realized like for something like this, we had rehearsal time. So for certain productions, for certain shows, you know, you, everything comes about a budget or cost, but you got to realize specific gags. We need more time, more preparation. And like, we need to rehearse this, especially at that time when it was my first one. Mm -hmm. um, so right away, as soon like into the, the rehearsal, just hearing um, the other performers, you know, uh, giving me pointers and what to do and not to do. I was totally comfortable from the get go, but you always have, I mean, it's fire. I mean, you always have a little piece in your mind, but I think when if you're a stunt performer, especially in the old days, um, you have there's something wrong in your mind because you have to be able to say, "No, I'm just going to do it," and you don't think about it. And you, whether you tell yourself there's nothing to worry about, and then you almost lie to yourself that you believe it, um, almost like just cowboy, just get out there and do it. But I do find like these days it's a lot more calculated and a lot, a lot more rehearsed, a lot more safe. Uh, thank God. But uh, for, yeah, for me, and but that comes back to martial arts. My my mentor, Steve Anderson, just really to you lie to yourself enough that you start believing and that's fine. I'm fine. I don't have a cold. What are you talking about? Like stuff like that. So it might not be the healthiest thing, but it uh, it comes in handy when needed. And what's the most important lesson you've learned so far through your career of stunt performing outside of changing the way your mindset is? Most important lesson, you don't know what you don't know. And even the things you think you know, you might not know. So always be open-minded. Um, you're never above any stunt, whether it's a small gag or whatever. Someone might have a different experience and you might learn something just by hearing their story or hearing their pointers or tips. But just keep in mind, like, you don't know what you don't know. And even things that you do know, you might not necessarily know. That's fair. And having the career that you do, is there anything that scares you anymore? Knowing that, you know, next month they're going to say, hey, we're going to set you on fire or plunge you into a polar bear dip. Is there anything that just kind of gets you, eh, you know, that, that one's new. I'm a little yeah, if, uh Yeah. If they say, if I get a call and they're like, hey, Daniel, you available? Uh Tuesday and I'm like yeah yeah what's the gig and then they're like oh um you, you need to be like uh in the speedo going into Lake Ontario in January be like mm, I think I'm busy that day <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that to be honest but in terms of like uh if it's a you know drive scene or a clip like I'm always gonna say yes to work that I'm comfortable doing if it's something I'm not comfortable doing I would not say yes because you don't want to put the coordinator or production in that position so you always have to be honest with yourself first but uh yeah i wouldn't do anything that i'm not comfortable doing yeah yeah and are, is there anything that you're currently working on that you can share with us uh yeah i can actually talk about this it's a canadian feature i'm actually in a hotel room right now we're shooting in sudbury oh, wow. uh, for the last we've been here for what, like six weeks now or so it's a movie called 40 Acres. It's written by R.T. Thorne. Uh, it's looking fantastic, but I might be biased, but it looks great. It's a thriller action. Uh, it's in a world where we don't know what year it is. We don't know how it got to this point, but there's no meat on Earth. Hmm. Uh, the only food there is is whatever you can grow. So if you have a lot of land, you know, you have a farm, you can grow your own uh, fruits and vegetables. But then you have a people, you know, they're starving. So they might uh, trespass on your territory and steal your stuff. And if there's not stuff, I mean, you start eating people, not because you want to, just because you're starving. So you're dealing with a lot of uh, with cannibals. But the movie which will be our last shooting day is October 26th. Oh, nice. Um, so realistically, it'll probably come out next year. But it will be amazing especially as a, a Canadian like uh, feature, it'll be amazing. Yeah, it looks really good so far. Canadian cannibalism. Okay. Let's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'm looking forward to seeing that one come out. You'll have to keep me posted on that. For sure. 
And where can people learn more about you as an actor and as a performer? Uh, are you on the social medias? Can we go to IMBD? Where where can we learn more about you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm on uh, IMDb as my name, Daniel Levine. Uh, if you want to go on Instagram, because I feel like I'm more on Instagram these days, uh, answering people's questions, which is uh, I go under the name of DJLBKO um, or Facebook as my name as well. But usually I'm more on people tend to shoot me some questions on Instagram these days more than anything. Wonderful. And Daniel, if someone said to you, what's something that people tend to misunderstand about you? What would you say? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a fantastic question. I think uh, if you know me or if people who kind of know me, they'll be, you'll think that uh, my work is, is my life and I love what I do. And I think I'm fortunate to do what I do. And I probably would do it for free, to be honest, because you got it. You you kind of do do it for free to start up, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I love my family. Like I have a five year old. My son is fantastic, and I I would choose him any day of the week. But uh, no, people tend to think I'm a workaholic, and I think it's different once you actually love what you do. It doesn't. It never really feels like work. Mm-hmm. But I would definitely I would pick my son, although I would think about it and then no, nah, I'm just joking. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have time for one last question for you. And I think I know the answer. Uh, yeah. But Daniel, what makes you smile? My son. <laughs> yeah, no, my son's Tyson. He's five. Uh, he's, no, he's fantastic. He was, um, he was, di- I don't even know if you know this, Chris. He was diagnosed with PMS, which is Phelan McDermott syndrome at the age of one and a half. And this super rare syndrome that I've never heard of uh it's linked to autism it's like a deletion in the chromosome and uh so he's he's very delayed and he has hypertonia so it's very wobbly but he's in no pain and he's constantly smiling which is making us smile constantly which is it's a beautiful thing so yeah so as soon as you hear that dada right away i just smile right away so yeah so the answer would be my son kind of guess that one from your last response (laughs) but uh, as i said daniel that was the last question i have for you everyone out there please make sure you get an opportunity uh to google uh instagram and imbd our wonderful guest today daniel levine thank you so much for being here with us today sir everyone out there remember to smile to inspire and have a fantastic day thank you again thank you guys i really appreciate it thank you chris